Okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the September 6, 2024 regular meeting of the Regional Planning Committee. I'm Joel Lacava, Chair of the Committee and the Representative for the City of San Diego. Before I move forward, I'd like to ask our interpreter to provide instructions on how the public can access interpretation. Thank you. Announcement from the interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom where the meeting controls are, then click on language interpretation icon, which is a world, and then select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app, which is your cell phone or your tablet, then please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose the language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Also, headsets are available for interpretation. If you're in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, desplácese la parte inferior de su pantalla donde están los controles del Zoom, después haga clic en el icono de interpretación que tiene forma de globo terráqueo y después seleccione español o Spanish. Si está usando la aplicación móvil de Zoom desde su iPad o su teléfono, entonces presione los puntos suspensivos, luego presione interpretación y después seleccione el idioma español. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio o silenciar el audio original. También tenemos auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si usted se encuentra presencialmente en la sala de la reunión, pida unos auriculares a la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. I want to ask our clerk, Ms. Lero, to confirm we have a quorum. Thank you, Chair. We do have a quorum. All right. Uh, and I think uh, for voting going forward, we will simply do it by raising hands rather than using the, the clickers. So let us start the meeting with the Kumaye land acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumaye people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Sandak community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of Kumaye. With that, I will now call the, the September 6, 2024 regular meeting of the Regional Planning Committee to order. Let's start up uh, by doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and face the flag if you're able. Hand over your heart. Ready to begin. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You want to make some opening comments? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, before we go to non-agenda public comment, we'll start out with opening comments from our CEO, sir. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Um, I think I'm in month number two, <laughs> starting. Uh, we've learned quite a bit in the recent months. Uh, we'll be coming to the board of directors um, later this month to provide an update. Um, we really are working, I'm really looking forward close, working closely with this committee and with all the PACs. Um, we are really trying to enhance the level of the policy advisory committees and how they are getting involved. A couple of updates that I wanted to bring in. On item six, I'll talk a little bit about a trip up that we took to Sacramento as it relates to RENA. Um, there was a, a delegation from Perth, Australia that we met. Uh, with them um, in yesterday and discuss a lot about our multimodal network, our interest in work with the military and good discussions happen. On the Pershing Bikeway, since we last met, we opened the Pershing Bikeway. It gives the region an additional 2.2 miles of bike and pedestrian pathways passing through Balboa Park. The total project cost was $27.5 million. On the inland trail, construction has started in June, second to last segment until the entire inland trail is expected to be completed by 2026. This project is about $26 million. On Otay Mesa East, the board approved by national agreement with Mexico on the revenue sharing. This allows us to start scoping the back office system that will be working, that will work with both countries to collect the tolls. The, bowl, the board of directors also directed staff to develop a temporary working group to address environmental concerns affecting the border region. And we're working on that and we'll be providing more update on that. Uh, the new MOU with um, Customs and Border Protection 
that was signed, it allows us to move forward with 100% of the design of the project. This is a huge milestone because it's going to allow us to move forward with the uh, determining the right cause, how much um, leveraging we're going to need, and prepare a very robust financial plan. On the low sun, the rail realignment started. We started a value analysis study, or will be starting to evaluate alternative routes to advance the environmental analysis process. We expect to complete the BA in November or December of this year. We'll come back to the board with more with the recommendations. On the Batiquitos Lagoon double track project, which is about 166 million, we soon plan to begin beach and sand replenishment and work at South Ponto State Beach in the existing California least, least term nesting habitat within the lagoon. This includes stretching with Badiquitos Lagoon. The public may see trucks hauling sand along Coast Highway between La Costa Avenue and Avenida Encinitas periodically over the next six months. Once the project is complete in 2028, up to 70,000 cubic yards of sand will have been deposited. The double track itself will be about more than half a mile and expected to be completed in 2028. Regarding the purple line, Rapid 688 survey, we had a public workshop last week on the purple line. Imp important to recognize that the purple line project will take decades to be built. And in the meantime, we're hearing a lot and clear from the community that they need something now. We held public workshops last week and the team is finishing up and planning the planning study about a new transit service between San Isidro and Sorrento Mesa. We will be bringing an update to the board early next year once the initial planning work is complete. In the meantime, we're working for, we're, we're asking the public to go to our webpage um, by October 8th to go and um, do, uh, let us know about important destinations they need to travel to this route. So that's gonna help us really scope out that project. Regarding the Diamond Awards, we will be hosting uh, annual the Diamond Awards next week, September 17. This is an opportunity to acknowledge 137 local employers who have gone above and beyond to implement sustainable practices for their employees. Regarding Clean Air Day on October the 2nd, uh, it's free right in California Clean Air Day. So we're encouraging everybody to pledge to commute for clean air on Wednesday, October 2nd by walking, biking, carpooling, or riding transit for free. And this is um, possible thanks to the support of MTS and North County Transit. That concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate those uh, updates. With that, we'll move to non-agenda public comment. For our, for our board policy, the amount of time allowed for each verbal public comment is determined based on the number of agenda items, the complexity of the items, and the number of persons anticipated to offer comment. This allows us to hear from as many people as possible and to complete our business while we still have a quorum. And based on those factors for today's meeting, each member of the public will be allowed two minutes for their comments. Tessa, do we have any non-agenda public comment? Thank you, Chair. I have one non-agenda public comment. Truth, please come to the podium. Hey there, uh, Mario. Rebecca is going to be very happy about that pledge. Congratulations. I'm happy to be at a meeting that doesn't start at nine in the morning. Uh, but I have a question. Where is Tara? She never shows up. According to the San Diego Signal, quote, missing in action. Supervisor Tara misses 74% of committee votes. At supervisor's meeting, she has missed 190 votes or 8.4% of all board votes, end quote. So there needs to be a policy where anyone who misses more than three meetings without a publicly announced and approved reason is permanently removed from all boards and all committees. I'd also like to see more equity with Sandag contracted CBOs. The equity working group showed only two CBOs in North County and only one CBO in East County with all the rest in Chula Vista and in the city of San Diego. And one was SBCS who blew through millions of county taxpayers' money with, in only one month with zero financial accountability, no audit, nothing. A Sandag Habitat Conservation Plan presentation said $1.2 billion of taxpayer dollars had been used to buy 90,000 acres of land. And it came up about the 30 by 30 plan by the state trying to take away 30% of the lands from people's use. 
Kim Smith said the January flooding was climate change, which was a lie. Everybody knows the pump stations were in need of repair and the storm channels were blocked with trees and garbage. And speaking of garbage, 6.2% of Transnet goes to Sandag's environmental mitigation program. Why can't some of that money go to wastewater infrastructure and Tijuana River diversion and treatment projects? The excuses for finally addressing this issue are running out. Tick tock. And if I do free ride day, do I be? Is it still clean air day? Think about that one. I'd also like Sandak to stop being science deniers. Battery energy storage sites are not clean energy when they repeatedly catch fire like the one in Otay Mesa or the one that just happened in Escondido, both of which have lithium fumes that emit hazardous cancer-causing chemicals like hydrogen cyanide. And the same applies to EVs. The green agenda is killing the planet. Thank you. And that concludes the public comments for non-agenda items. All right. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, do we have any comments from committee members? Not seeing any, we'll move right along the consent agenda. There's two items on the consent, approval of the minutes from our May 3rd meeting and a quarterly status report on Sandegg's grant programs. Uh, Tessa, do we have any public comment on the consent item? I have one public commenter in person, Truth. Please come to the podium and she will be speaking on both consent items. All right, glad to be the only one here for item two. The minutes say that out of a, a county of 3.3 million people, once again, only one commenter. That's outrageous. What do we do about this? And it's also strange that the minutes from that joint meeting on June 21st aren't being approved as over three months ago now. Item three, there's been 25 years of conservation planning from a transportation agency. And what we've got is bat caves to show for it. Weren't bats the thing that NIH was paying China to experiment with on viruses in 2019? Coincidence, of course. Um, so maybe the, we the people have safer and more sensible projects we need completed that maybe some have been waiting three decades for, just something to think about. As I said, Sandag tends to hold grantees accountable for completing the project, but why did that happen with FACT, who got their grant lesson, but it did not happen with Pedal Ahead, who funneled millions to Nathan Fletcher's campaigns in the local Democratic Party? There's the EMP LMG to enhance size of regional habitat preserves and to protect endangered species, which has used $18 million of tax money. Is that to protect mountain lions to kill our pets and bite our faces off? That's the first time I said that without laughing. $59 million has gone to stack impact development near unsafe and inefficient public transit. Given the violence and crime that has occurred on public transit, I request a Vision Zero program for public transit. I want no person who relies on public transit to be subject to any possibility of injury, assault, or death. It needs to be taken more seriously than bike lanes, which very few, mostly rich people with $6,000 e-bikes benefit from. National City spent over $2 million a mile for a bikeway. I've never seen anyone riding a bike there. El Cajon does not need car lanes taken away for $2.5 million bike lanes as part of the Green Street Gateway project. Nobody there rides bikes. It's 104 degrees today in El Cajon. Try riding a bike there, I dare you. And does Encinitas really need a study to figure out why ugly ADUs that tower over people's backyards cause displacement? It lowers home values. It's very obvious. Thank you. That concludes the public comments on consent. All right, thank you. So I'll turn it back uh, over to the board for any comments and uh, we'll need a motion on the consent item. Approval. Okay, thank you, sir. Second. I'm gonna second by Musgrove. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, that passes unanimously. Moving right along to item four, we'll take up a report, uh, item four, which is the Transnet Smart Growth Incentive Program. Uh, I believe Lizzie Havey and Goldie Perbon will give an overview of the Smart Growth Incentive Program and request feedback on evaluation criteria for cycle six. So when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair LaCava, members of the committee. My name is Goldie Herbon. I'm a part of the grants distribution team here at Sandag. I'm also the program manager for the Smart Growth Incentive Program. I am joined this afternoon by my colleague, Lizzie Havey, and she supports the Sustainable Communities team here at Sandag. And today we're here to discuss the Smart Growth Incentive Program's draft evaluation criteria for the next cycle of funding. It's cycle six. Um, the evaluation criteria serves as a guideline to use when assessing the quality of projects that are submitted for the upcoming cycle. <clears throat> 
The Smart Growth Incentive Program is a competitive grant initiative funded exclusively by the Transnet Extension Ordinance. This program provides funding for planning efforts and transportation related infrastructure improvements that support smart growth development. The primary goal of the program is to offer financial support to a wide range of projects that help our local jurisdictions um, better integrate transportation and land use planning. Smart growth refers to the development pattern that is compact, efficient, and environmentally sensitive. It aims to focus future growth and infill development near jobs, services, and public facilities. This approach maximizes the use of existing infrastructure and helps preserve open spaces and natural resources. Sandag has successfully implemented five cycles of smart growth incentive program funding to date, starting with cycle one that was in 2009 and the latest cycle was cycle five implemented in 2022. The award amounts for each of the cycles are illustrated in the bar chart on the left. And since the program's inception, we've invested a total of $60 million into the region for smart growth projects. The pie chart on the right shows you that a majority of that funding has gone to capital construction projects at about 75%, while 25% has gone to smart growth planning projects. To date, the smart growth program has funded over 70 planning and capital projects. Additionally, the program has also successfully leveraged 47 million from other funding sources, bringing the total investment into the region for just over $100 million. On this slide, you can see four images from smart growth incentive projects from the city of Lemon Grove, Chula Vista, San Marcos, and the city of San Diego. Other notable infrastructure projects not indicated on this slide are traffic calming infrastructure projects, pedestrian promenades, and improvements to curbs, gutters, and sidewalks. Past planning projects I want to highlight include um, the development of innovative financing mechanisms, mixed use and commercial corridor plans, and complete street design manuals. Now I'll hand it over to Lizzie so she can discuss several of the cycle six updates. Great, thank you. Um, so to talk a little bit about this cycle, cycle six. So the Smart Growth Incentive Program is open to the cities and the county of San Diego. Um, with the adoption of the 2021 regional plan, we moved away from previously defined smart growth opportunity areas and are now allowing for more flexibility for the Smart Growth Incentive Program and proposing no geographic constraints. With expanded project eligibility, projects must align with the 2021 regional plan, overall better integrate transportation and land use, and advance smart growth principles, multimodal transportation, and equity. These these three grant categories will be available for this upcoming cycle. Um, these categories include climate action planning, which, which allows our jurisdictions to prepare or update their local climate action plans and greenhouse gas reduction plans. Then we have planning, which includes plans and processes that accelerate smart growth, but will not directly result in the construction of a project, such as downtown or specific area plans. And then lastly, capital, which are projects eventually resulting in that um, construction of a public improvement project, such as housing supportive infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure enhancements, traffic calming, traffic calming projects, to name a few examples. Um, this is what we're proposing for SKIP cycle six. We have upwards of $30 mil $35 million available with potential for more funds to be added. Displayed on the screen, we have a proposed breakdown of the funding. 3 million for climate action planning, 7 million for planning, and 25 million for capital. The maximum and minimums for each category are listed to the chart on the right. We heard from our working groups comprised of your local staff that due to increased costs for capital projects, there is a need to raise the maximum awards. We raised the awards to $3 million from 2.5, but working groups expressed desire for a higher amount. If we raise the maximum awards higher, we could better fund projects, leveraging funds for a bigger impact, but this could lead to funding less projects. At the end of the presentation, we would like your recommendation if the maximum award should be raised, understanding the considerations to fund more or less projects if the award is raised. And then to talk a little bit about the timeline. So we've um, worked with your local staff. Um, we've gone to the different working groups. Um, we're now here talking to you all, the Regional Planning Committee, and we also got feedback from the Transportation Committee. In October and November, we'll go back to, we'll, 
or will go to the first time, excuse me, to the Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee or ITOC and then back to TC and RPC for a recommendation to the board. After the board approves the release for the call for projects, SKIP cycle um, six will be open to the jurisdictions and applications will be due in February. After the valuation period, we'll take the funding recommendations to ITOC, Transportation Committee, RPC, and the Board of Directors. And then I'll pass it back to Goldie to talk a little bit more about the valuation criteria. Thanks, Lizzie. So attachment one to this item contains the draft evaluation criteria and scoring rubric for which we're here to seek your input on. Um, I'll first rev review the draft evaluation criteria for each respective grant category, followed by a discussion of some additional items, um, transportation committee recommendations that we've gotten and audit recommendations that we've incorporated into this cycle as well. Oops, it's already on that slide. So on this slide are two of the three program categories, planning and capital, and their respective evaluation criteria. The draft evaluation criteria is consistent with past smart growth incentive program funding cycles, the transnet ordinance, and the 2021 regional plan. Each criteria is numbered here in the tables, and um, underneath um, some criteria do have sub-criteria that are lettered below. So I'll go through each one and their nuances depending on the type of project they're submitting. So the first one is relationship to regional transit. Projects will be assessed on their proximity to mobility hubs and transportation areas. This evaluation criteria is worth 10% of um, possible points. Evaluation criteria two is further regional plan and sustainable communities implementation strategies. This category evaluates how projects further land use and mobility integration with added emphasis on sustainable communities implementation strategies. Evaluation criteria three is smart growth policy implementation. Projects will be assessed on their alignment with smart growth principles. So that includes land use, urban design, mobility, sustainability, and resilience. Evaluation criteria number four is project feasibility. Across both categories, we're adding this particular evaluation criteria so that we can understand um, the feasibility of the project and their ability to efficiently use program funds. Um, and that'll be demonstrated by the quality of the project's scope of work, budget, and schedule. Um, additionally, in this category, you can see the sub uh, criteria community engagement. The degree to which community engagement is incorporated into the project will also be evaluated under this uh, evaluation criteria. Um, note that for number four, there's an added sub criteria for capital projects. That's 4A, major milestones completed. So we've added this so that evaluators can understand at what stage a capital improvement project is at. Is design completed? Um, are there environmental clearances that still need to be um, executed? Are right-of-way permits secured? Things of that nature. We want to understand how close the project is to construction for planning purposes. Evaluation criteria number five is board policy 33. It's required that the smart growth program have this evaluation criteria weighted at 25% of the total possible points. Board policy 33 ensures that awarded funds have compliant housing elements and are demonstrating pro-housing policies. And finally, the last evaluation criteria is matching funds. And while not required, projects with matching funds, including in-kind resources and other funding mechanisms, will receive additional points at 5% of total score. So now I'll go over the final grant category, that's climate action planning and their um, evaluation criteria. So just as a reminder, SANDAG requires local jurisdictions to have an adopted climate action plan in order to receive grant funding. So this funding category is available for two types of projects. The first one is climate action plan or CAP, CAP development or CAP updates. So these are for agencies that need to adopt a climate action plan or update their climate action plan. And additional activities that are eligible under this project type could also include greenhouse gas inventory or forecasts. These projects will be evaluated under criteria one on this table. The second project type is CAP implementation and monitoring. This is for agencies with an updated CAP seeking funding for um, those types of projects, implementing and monitoring activities and these types of projects will be evaluated under criteria two here. 
So the first two criteria for this category are based on EIR requirements from the 2021 regional plan. And the remaining criteria three through five are repeat criteria that I just went over on the last slide. You can find more detail again in your attachment one. So you may have noticed that board policy 33 is listed on every single valuation criteria for each category. Um, and that's because it's required of us by board policy 33, which was adopted in 2006, that this evaluation criteria be put in to um, criteria and it has to be a total weight of 25% of total possible points. Um, and the policy um, bases the points on how well a jurisdiction jurisdiction adopts pro-housing policies and demonstrates their commitment to advancing housing equity. And the scoring will be based on these two sub-criteria on the slide um, pulled from the board policy. So in addition to updating the evaluation criteria for this cycle, staff have also incorporated transportation committee and ITOC audit recommendations to cycle six um, processes. The first set of changes I wanna talk about first is the Transnet Triannual Performance Audit Recommendations. Every three years, ITOC conducts this performance audit and it evaluates how funding is utilized and tracks compliance with state mandates and the progress toward meeting prior audit recommendations. The most recent audit was completed in the beginning of this year and the recommended actions for grants are on the slide here. Um, I want to highlight that many of these recommendations are administrative in nature, so they'll be implemented on the back end by our grants team. Um, it's uh, speaking to like how well you document progress and completion of the project and if they delivered the projects that we um, had that had been proposed. So our, again, our team will implement that internally. And to address these, we've um, developed a new project completion report um, in June 2024 that requires many of these audit recommendations. And um, it details how projects will um, submit final payment and how we confirm that the project was completed. Um, there are two, however, re recommendations that I want you to pay attention to because they will impact the grantee directly. Um, the first one is performance measures on the top left and more detailed scopes of work in the top center. So the audit recommendation recommends that projects have more detailed projects, scope of works and specific performance measures tied to each project. Um, projects must demonstrate that the final outcomes meet the requirements outlined in the agreement. And finally, projects must show that the completed project achieves the attended outcomes. So these are things that cycle six um, applicants can anticipate including in their applications materials or um, when they submit their quarterly progress reports, these things will be asked throughout the term of their project. Okay, lastly, I wanna go over um, a couple process changes that have come out of the transportation committee. These changes aim to enhance transparency and to ensure a more equitable distribution of funding across the region. So first, the transportation committee requests enhancing scoring rubrics. So staff have detailed, um, have developed more detailed scoring rubrics, which again, you can see in attachment one, which clearly identify response levels and required content for each um, evaluation scoring. Um, two is encourage evaluator consensus. Um, CNDAG staff will be holding meetings with evaluators to encourage consensus building. We'll be collecting notes on their applications on each of the applications they scored, and we'll be sharing those with applicants post-award. Um, the next item is using average scores. We've heard loud and clear that TC would like us to utilize average scores instead of ranking um, applications to simplify the process and reduce any confusion. And finally, geographic distribution of funding. Um, we'll be distributing funding throughout the region, limiting awards concentrated to a single area or a single jurisdiction. That concludes my presentation. I'll turn it over to Chair LaCava to open the floor for comments. Um, again, we are seeking comments on the criteria, but if there's anything else in the presentation that like Lizzie talked about any of the category caps and things, we welcome those comments. Our contact information is on this slide though. If you can't get your comment in, please feel free to email us. We'll take comments through either medium. All right, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for good work on this. Uh, Tessa, do we have any public comment on this item? 
Thank you. I have one public comment on item four. Truth, please come to the podium. All right, I heard there was $35 million available. You know, that could buy what, one bike lane maybe? Is that Lemon Grove Trolley Plaza done? Because it doesn't look like it. Uh, have any of you actually been there, especially at night? Because the plaza is full of drug addicts. Uh, where are the developments that benefit safety if they're all near public transit, which is not safe? And where's the Vision Zero plan for Sandag's bike curbs that have led to fatalities like for 48-year-old Ryan Curry in Encinitas? It sometimes says stupid growth catalyzes compact mixed-use development. Uh, who wants to be stacked and packed? And how does that fulfill the goal of preserving open space? It's kind of an opposite. Or increasing housing choices if there's only one choice. Or increasing transportation choices if people lose out on the personal freedom of having a car. Because big corporate developers are able to make big profits by not having to include parking spaces. How can Sandai ensure equity for people who can't buy enough groceries, not just because of the cost, but because they don't have a car to put them in? How can the stupid growth principle of distinctive communities be met if every once distinct community becomes full of ugly stack and packs? If y'all want to keep up the housing charade, then yes, remove the geographic discrimination and start giving grants out to the backcountry areas. But no to giving what sounds like an unlimited amount of grants to any one applicant. That's no different than when FACT was getting most of the grants. The degree to which the community has been engaged with, with outreach should be ranked much higher. But I appreciate it going through a review. We'll see how that goes. I'm not going to hold my breath. Lacks ADU standards and fourplexes with no minimum parking spaces and single family home zones is an evil. Nothing deserving of points. It's ruining neighborhoods, causing displacement, and making big corporate developers rich. So, Joe, to answer your past question about differing opinions on ADUs, if you ask Blackstone or Black Rock, the city of San Diego, bending over backwards is great at making them rich. If you ask regular people in Mira Mesa who end up with three two-story buildings towering over their backyards, stealing the sunshine and privacy, it's a bad thing. Thank you. And that concludes the public comments on item four. All right, thank you, Tessa. Uh, so we'll turn it over to committee members, and as you heard, they're just looking for our input, any questions or comments you might have, and Council Member Musgrove. Thank you, Chair. I would just like to comment firstly on the Armalite project. When I was a young patrol deputy, sometime during the last century, Armalite was a very popular place. Um, if it was a slow night, you'd be guaranteed to get a felony arrest. It turned a light industrial portion of the city of San Marcos into a fantastic opportunity literally across the street from Palomar College, which has a major bus center and right across from the transit uh, sprinter station. And the proximity to the freeway for those who have to commute is one block south. It's, it's a, a great project and we enjoy it very much. And secondly, the, the question then is, this is the draft. Do you anticipate when this will be coming out for our cities? We anticipate November that we'll have the final call for projects released and we'll bring in the more final call for projects to you all in October. Terrific. Uh, great presentation and excellent work. Thank you. Actually, RPC will be getting it in November. <laughs> so for those of us who don't follow timelines very carefully, could you explain how that works, that sequence works? In terms of when the matrix will be adopted, it will be yeah. released and when it comes to RPC? So first step is we go to the working groups, which, we, which we've already right. done. Then we go to RPC and TC for a feedback on the evaluation criteria. Okay. Then we go back, craft the call for projects. We go to the independent taxpayer oversight committee, I talk. Then we come back to RPC and TC for your recommendation to the board of directors. Oh, okay. And then the board approves it and then we release the call for projects. And then release, okay. Just trying to follow the bouncy yes. ball. So we'll be going to ITOC and TC in October, back here in November, and then to the board at the meeting after this one. Very good. So okay. it's, a, it's a very nonlinear timeline then. <laughs> exactly. Very, very fluid. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Vice Mayor uh, Yamani. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm here for a uh, representative for County Water Authority, but I'd like to take advantage of uh, being a Vice Mayor for City of National City to um, thank Sandag for the... Uh, um, 
the um, City of National Together We Plan grant that um, Sandag and City of National City had worked. It's completed and uh, just wanted to make sure that I thank the staff for working with National City to completing this project um, for the City of National City constituents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Any other comments by committee? Um, I'll just throw a couple in. Um, uh, like Council Member Musgrove, I'll challenge my memory. I think the Bird Rock roundabouts were early um, uh, benefit benefiters of this program. I think that was my very first interaction with Sandag, the very first time I was in this uh, in this room. Um, and I know that it has gotten very much more competitive since those days. Um, and to that point, how competitive is it and how does the new matrix really help you differentiate between all the submittals? Um, it really depends cycle by cycle, the level of, you know, competition, um, people submitting. Um, for this SKIP cycle six, jurisdictions are allowed to submit multiple applications. However, um, for example, if a jurisdiction submits like three applications, we'll go through the list of highest ranking and making sure all the jurisdictions who meet the minimum criteria um, are funded. And then we would go to the second application of said jurisdiction, for example. Like um, so it really depends. You know, this is quite a large bucket of funding, larger than we've had in the past. So we'll see from our jurisdictions if how you all apply. We really, it's hard to gauge. Um, it has been competitive in the past, but we, you know, we recently had a housing acceleration program grant, and that was um, not funded to the complete level of funding available. So it really depends. We hope to see as many projects come in, though. Absolutely. Certainly, the Chairman, last extra dollars can make a difference. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I think the criteria has really the thought process. Um, really, they put really a lot of thought process in the criteria of um, um, you know, I'm into award grants. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you bring up the criteria slide again? Yeah. Do you have a preference, you... this one or the next one? No, you just wanted us to comment on this, so I thought oh, it okay. might be helpful to have this slide up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you've removed the geographic constraints that we've used in the past, but there are still points that benefit proximity, the key things, housing, uh, regional transportation. So there's still, we haven't lost that element of it. And then I guess the last question I'll ask, uh, the geographic funding distribution that was recommended by the uh, RTC, how do you, do, have you thought about how that would work or is that still kind of, are you just kind of mulling that over? That's essentially what I was explaining oh, okay. with the application process. Um, so funding, you know, the first, all the different jurisdictions, if they're above the minimum criteria, and then funding the second or third applications from a single jurisdiction. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're not talking about geographic distribution across the county, but okay, I got you. Yeah, and it really depends on who applies. Yeah. So. Very good. Okay, well, thank you again for the good work as as our vice mayor uh, uh, stated, uh, really good work. I know this is not easy stuff. Uh, and then getting all the applications and really trying to parse them out and try to figure out which ones deserve. But that last dollar uh, that a project needs, this can be really critical. So thank you for the good work for that again. This is a, discuss, a discussion for the purposes of input, uh, and we'll see this again in November. So thank you very much. Thank you. For your good work. And with that, we'll now move on to item five, which is the regional housing needs allocation update. Uh, and to kick things off, we'll go to our CI CEO. Thank you. Um, green is something that I'm still learning. <laughs> it's um, my expertise is transportation. So housing has been this uh, portion of the responsibility has been uh, a learning curve. But I did want to share that we travel to Sacramento, several uh, Antoinette uh, and others. Um, we went to Sacramento. We met with our counterparts from LA, Sacramento, and the Bay Area. And um, to discuss the policy changes that are facing statewide with RENA. And it's no surprise that housing uh, RENA is still on that list of concerns for all those uh, MPOs also. As a group, we met with the Director of California Department of Housing Community Development, Gustavo Velasquez, 
And he personally conveyed to him, we personally conveyed to him the concerns that we have raised, uh, that have been raised by our board here. Um, we let let them know that we're working on principles for potential legislation and look forward to hearing today's discussion because we actually be meeting with him um, next week. I will be meeting with him. So today's discussion is going to be um, insightful and provide me some more guidance on where we should uh, be bringing up. Um, I'll turn it on to Stacy to provide the update. Thanks, Mario. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Stacy Cooper. I'm a senior planner on the Sustainable Communities team. Some of you are very familiar with the Regional Housing Needs Assessment process, or RENA. Others may be less so. So what is RENA? RENA is a state-mandated process to determine how much housing must be planned for to meet projected and existing housing needs at a variety of affordability levels in each jurisdiction. Our region is currently in the sixth cycle, but the state's already taking steps to improve the methodology and process for the seventh cycle. gets me every time. Um, okay, so how did we get here? Assembly Bill 101 directed the California Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD, to develop recommendations related to the RENA process and methodology to promote and streamline housing development and address California's housing crisis. HCD kicked off the process with a public meeting in March of last year, followed by a public survey, a series of sounding board meetings, and other outreach. SANDAG participated in all opportunities offered by the state and conducted similar outreach and engagement to inform local jurisdictions about the process and encourage direct participation in the survey and communication with HCD. SANDAG invited HCD to the March 22nd board meeting where the deputy director presented an update on the department's efforts towards the seven cycle reform and the board provided their feedback. In April, HCD released California's Housing Future 2020-40 the next RENA report. Today, I'll present a high-level overview of the report and provide an update on the steps that SANDAG is taking in the reform process. So this slide lists a summary of the feedback that the board provided to HCD at the March meeting. Members voiced their concerns over the lack of transparency, lack of funding, lack of flexibility, and the loss of local control. HCD's legislative report was released less than a month after, while, it, while the report incorporated the state's audit, state auditor's recommendations, it didn't address many of our region's concerns. So the HCD report, this thing right here, um, is structured into three different sections and identifies several different issues related to the determination stage, allocation stage, or general issues related to the over, overarching RENA process. Overall, the report recommends procedural and informational enhancements to processes, but in many instances lacks detail on how and when these changes will be made. So HCD outlined 10 recommendations to the legislature listed on this slide. These are specific recommendations to state code, which HCD has provided and with reasoning for each, but these cannot be implemented without legislation. Those that might have the biggest impact on our region and we're keeping a close eye on include number one, accounting for the housing needs of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, since the release of the report, legislation has been introduced that would add two new income categories, acutely low and extremely low income. AB 3093 was introduced by Ward and is supported by Governor Newsom. Number three, treatment of populations living in group quarters. The report didn't provide enough information to gather if this will have a positive or negative impact in our region. And number five, further and balance the five objectives of RENA. Primarily that a Council of Governments or COG must obtain approval from HCD before adopting their methodology. This would give HCD a larger role in the allocation process. HCD identified three policy considerations to the legislature. These will have no immediate impact on our region, but represent that HCD is signaling to state officials and local leaders that they should continue discussing these ideas. Um, and then there's nine plan administrative changes that could be um, implemented under HCD's current statutory authority, meaning that HCD can implement these without changes to state law. These include various adjustments to the RENA methodology, greater transparency during the determination process, more technical assistance and guidance from HCD. We're closely monitoring those that could have the biggest impact of our, in our region, including number three, refining the jobs housing determination adjustment factor. We're looking into how they intend to do these refinements and determine the impact. 
Number four, accounting for housing loss to vacation homes and short-term rentals. Our region has a large and growing number of vacation homes and short-term rentals, so this could increase our arena determination. And then number seven, treatment of people living in group quarters. Again, this is related to the recommendation to the legislature. We don't have enough information to determine the impact. So in June, we presented an overview of the report to the Sustainable Communities Working Group, which is comprised of the planning directors from the local jurisdictions. In summary, like the board, they're very interested in being more involved with the seventh cycle and echoed comments about the lack of funding and lack of transparency. Overall, they requested more clarity and timely guidance from HCD in a variety of areas related to APRs and housing elements. And the feedback on the, sc on the screen reflects what we heard in June from the working group. In July, staff presented a high-level overview of the HCD report, including the initial comments from the Sustainable Communities Working Group to the Executive Committee. One of the Executive Committee's board-delegated responsibilities is to review and act on state and federal legislation. Since HCD's report did not address many of the region's concerns, staff also presented a draft letter to be sent to the Senate and Assembly, Senate and Assembly Housing Chairs uh, with guiding principles to be considered during upcoming legislative cycles. The letter outlined five legislative principles, sustainable funding, local context, greater transparency, a regional approach, approach, and to prioritize the number of people housed. And there's a link to that draft letter in the report. Uh, the executive committee provided feedback on the draft letter and directed staff to work with the Sustainable Communities Working Group to strengthen the language in the letter and discuss the inclusion of additional principles. Yesterday afternoon, we met with the working group to present the draft legislative principles and EC's feedback. We had a really robust conversation with the members and staff will work on the revised letter that incorporates their feedback and return to the working group on September 19th. So as I mentioned, we're working with the Sustainable Communities Working Group to revise the letter. And we'll continue to actively monitor legislation related to RENA and HCD's implementation efforts and provide updates to RENA reform to jurisdiction staff, RPC, the executive committee, and the board. Um, and one of the things I forgot to mention is that once we get this letter finalized with the Sustainable Communities Working Group, we'll be going back to executive committee and then submitting with their approval of this letter to the state. And that concludes my presentation. Interested in hearing your feedback. All right, thank you, Stacey. Uh, with that, uh, we'll go to public comment. Tessa? Thank you, Chair. I have one public comment on item five. Truth, please come to the podium. All right, why can't California's housing future 2040 look like single family homes? Why is it that my generation is expected to settle for much less than all of your guys' generation? Have you ever considered that? And if Sandag is all about equity, then why would Sandag be recommending not building housing in the unincorporated areas? Why is the backcountry always thrown under the expensive electric bus? And Mario, isn't it amazing how regional governance keeps expanding into new areas? It's almost like you need two CEOs or something. Were you able to talk to Gustavo face to face? Did you ask him why he couldn't meet the BOD in person? because they had the minions come here via Zoom for a chewing out session about the state's nonsense arena quotas. Then less than one month later, they drop new recommendations or demands that may come with extortion fees on the cities. Has anyone even questioned why the state government is coming up with quotas for the housing market like we're in the Soviet Union? Are we going to do the same thing they did by fudging the numbers to please the central government, where the result was mass starvation? Are we not seeing something similar with the mass exodus from the state because of nonsense policies? Because they can add 100 new income categories, but what difference does that make for the small-time developers whose building supplies, insurance, and permits continue to cost more? I like in the quota swaps among cities, because basically the city of San Diego is going to, yeah, we'll definitely take all those sales taxes and let our neighborhoods become gentrified. Uh, we also know every city in this county can't meet the RENA quotas. Does the state have a program evaluation to see if anything they demand is actually working or not, or possible? If this unconstitutional regional governance wants to have more faux local say in the RENA quotas, have any of you advocated for a locally based HCD committee that works directly with SANDAC? The loss of local control is the second main cause of unaffordable housing because no one in Sacramento or D.C. can make proper decisions for anyone here. Not making the biohazard sewage a priority is a prime example. And all the, the board members' complaints about lack of transparency, transparency, funding, flexibility, and local control, that's how us regular people feel about Sandag on the whole. Thank you. And that concludes the public comments on that item. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Tessa. Uh, now we'll turn it over to the committee members for any comments, questions, any input uh, to what you'd like to see in that letter. Uh, Council Member Musgrove. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I sat here during the last reading cycle when the numbers bumped. I think it was from 116 to 177. We did that to ourselves. And I do recall also when we talk about item three, jobs and housing, how the evaluation process specifically for the Navy at North Island impacting Coronado were so skewed it was unrealistic. Uh, some of those sailors are on ships, some are in base housing, others are in housing affordable that the, the Navy provides. They're not living in their cars, but the numbers were not correlate because the jobs were very localized. So you had to have housing for them in a city that doesn't have open space to build housing. So I, I'm trusting that that's being addressed so that the at a local level, the jurisdictions can look at it and say there are exceptions. Uh, Camp Pendleton would have the same problem, except that a lot of their Marines live off base anyway in housing. Um, the other thing is we have a particular piece of property in San Marcos that is in the process now of planning for development. And it is, uh, I would estimate probably over 20 acres that could be developed, but a lot of the property has been identified as vernal pools. So when it rains, the fairy shrimp come out and we have Brodea. But a developer has figured out a way to move some of the plants, not impact the vernal pools, and still be able to put in some quality affordable housing for us by moving things around and fencing off that protected area that, that will remain. And my whole point in all this is, you know, we zone, we zone to meet the arena numbers, but we're not building homes. So the reality of it is when I, and I just had a conversation this morning with a developer that wants to build in our city, it's the timeline to get through all the hoops. And the reason I illustrated that 20 acre parcel that has been, I think it's gone through at least six different developers that wanted to build something on there. But when they start dealing with the state of California and all the timelines and we'll just under the umbrella of CEQA, EIRs, protected species, protected plants, potentials for A, B, C, and D, it's not cost effective. And, and, and they're not there to, you know, to, to rob the bank, but they have people they have to pay and those people live in our communities. So there needs to be a great deal of consideration given to the state's participation in the housing to accommodate a more favorable environment, not giving up everything, but working with the development community to say, okay, what can we do to streamline on our end to meet what the cities are doing. And if we get the zoning right and it becomes more cost effective, it would provide more housing. Now, whether that brings the cost down, that's a, a, a driven more by economics, but availability would be there. So a little long-winded, but I hope that's part of this overall conversation and you're getting some audience up in Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Donovan. Thank you, Chair. God bless you, Ed Musgrove. <laughs> you you brought up the uh, issue before I I could, but no, seriously, I, I wanted to ask Sandag if your presentation seemed to be around working with HCD, which is definitely needed. But I just wanted to bring up again the challenges that, in particular, Coronado had with the last go around that were kind of driven by our local organization, Sandag. The only criteria we were given in Coronado to set our allocation was the number of jobs in our city, within our city limits. The big thing that challenged us was the change that said in the past, the military jobs had been evenly spread, as my understanding, around the county. And this time around, and again, my understanding is we're the only county that did this, the military jobs were assigned to the jurisdiction they were in. Now, for those of you who may not know a lot about Coronado, the U.S. Navy owns about three times as much property within our city limits than, our, than we do, the city. And every day, more people come to work for the Navy than our population. Our population is around 20 or 21,000. The Navy employs about that many people every day. 
So that drove a huge challenge for us to meet our housing element. So again, not to be overly dramatic, but I guess my question is, is Sandag gonna look at some of the criteria that were put in place by Sandag? And are things like looking at how we handle military jobs, is that gonna be open for discussion and debate? Council Member Duncan or Donovan, I'll take that one. And okay. um, I just want to reassure you that when it gets time for cycle seven, we're going to be working really closely um, with this committee and the board on the methodology so that everybody um, is in agreement and concurs on how we move forward with the next RENA process. Okay, thank you. Was I correct that we're the only county that assigned military jobs to I the- I don't know that Okay, well, that's true, what I but... understand. And I couldn't, I can't understand that for the life of me. So we would definitely like to discuss that again, among other things. Yeah. Um, but I commend, I commend you for starting early working with San, uh, working with the uh, HCD because some of their guidelines, again, as you pointed out, that are driven by this, by the legislature also kind of drove a very, very strange process. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for the presentation. I feel like I saw a therapist because I feel like somebody's advocating for us. So I thank you and I thank Sandag. I think this is hopefully um, turning the page and, and being more of an advocate and listening to the board and also to the committees. So like Coronado, I'm just gonna mention the frustration in Del Mar. We have a little more than 25% of our land is the fairgrounds, which we have no jurisdiction over. And when we were assigned our arena numbers, we had uh, about three or four volunteers that literally went into every single job, every single business and counted jobs. There was a lot of people, including many of the council members, this was prior to me being on council that didn't, could not comprehend how our numbers could be, what our numbers were. We tried to understand the methodology and it took us about seven months ago until we understood how those numbers came about. So by that time, it was long past the time to even challenge you know, or audit those numbers. So transparency is gonna be really important and I'm glad you're addressing that. What happened is when we were able to find out the methodology and, and look at our job numbers, almost within probably 20 jobs, the number that these residents came up with was accurate. Our numbers are double what they should be. And I'm not going to bore you with everything, but I'm going to give you just a few examples. One is three and four and five day events at the fairgrounds could be up to 400 jobs. And we were given those job numbers. A school that was closed 12 years ago, 130 jobs that doesn't exist and hasn't existed for 12 years. 60 jobs to a home. What we learned was a multi level marketing company that somebody runs out of their home. And there are multiple businesses that have home addresses that show employees of 12, 14 that don't come to those homes. Um, and I could go on and on. I could give you many more examples. The fairgrounds is one of those. When the fair happens and you have somebody running the Ferris wheel, that job is being counted but then they're going to Orange County and then they're going to Santa Monica and, and probably counted again. I don't know, but my assumption is that. I also want to say Del Mar is a small town and we want to do our fair share. But with this last cycle, we have upzoned every single part of our town. Professional commercial, central commercial, north commercial. We don't have any more. We're 7, 1.7 square miles and over 25% of that is the fairgrounds. So I, I just think it's really important that one, cities are able to um, validate the numbers that they're real. I think it's also important that cities that got totally bashed um, has some mercy in the following cycle because from what I understand, and we wrote a letter to the board, I don't know if all the board members got that outlining all of this, but from what I understand is that there will be some penalties because as you know, we can't build it. It would be nice if we had money and we could build it. We have one small lot on our city hall and we have about a 4,000 lot and that's the only city property we have. We're so desperate. We're looking at putting tiny homes next to our water tanks for God's sake. So 
this is really important that we do it right. Um, I think it, in a dream, we'd have development dollars and be able to develop and do some beautiful affordable housing. We are working with the fairgrounds to get some affordable housing there. If that comes to pass, it's making really good progress. But these are the things where residents get very frustrated and then they start to look at this organization and, and, and see fault in it. I think the organization, in my opinion, as a newcomer has really turned over a new leaf and I'm really hopeful about the things that you've done, but the things that I see um, the outreach to communities. I think this is, can be a really powerful organization that can do great things, but we have to, to really advocate for each other, not just Del Mar, not just Coronado, but all of us work together so we can protect the quality of life we want in our communities, but also do the right thing and build affordable housing for accurate numbers. And then lastly, another thing, just um, two things. One is the preservation of natural affordable housing is really important. We have a lot of multifamily housing already on Stratford, which is in the south part of our town. But with the incentives for developers, they're incentivized to tear these down and rebuild them. If they become condominiums, they'll become second homes for people. They're not going to be primary homes. So we just need to talk frank about that. And that's one of the things that Sacramento doesn't get right, is that they think one, you know, one plan fits all. Your city's different than our city. You know, so I think if we could communicate that to them, I think that would be really important as well. Um, and then I said, I'm almost done, but I really am almost done. So <laughs> on homeless, I think it's also important. My background is a nurse. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to be very frank about homeless. There's some people that I'll tell you, just, I, I worked with the San Diego rescue mission and I met some families. There was a gentleman there, a married couple with four kids. They live paycheck to paycheck. His wife left them. He couldn't afford the apartment anymore. Those are the people we can help. But as a healthcare professional, I just want to say, we also need to address the elephant in the room, which is there is a lot of mental illness and those people should not be on the street, but housing them in homes probably will be the worst thing that we could do for them. They need an interdisciplinary approach to that. And the same with people with, with alcoholism as well um, or any drug problem. So I think it's important. Housing the homeless can be helpful. We know that foster children at risk and other things but putting it all in one bucket doesn't make sense. So thank you. And thank you for your work. And thank you for your work. This is really wonderful that we have an advocate. So I appreciate Mario. Thank you for going up there. It's really important to all of us. Thank you. Vice Chair, Vice Mayor, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Stacy, for the report. I think um, the feedback received are, are on point. And um, I sure hope that we would listen to them and, and um, act upon them. Um, you know, involvement of local jurisdiction is really, really very important. Transparency, uh, the data, you know, data doesn't lie. You know, it's very important. So um, I think we would, you know, th this feedback are really on point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues. Uh, Can I just, oh, yeah, really real quickly. I'm sorry, yeah. and I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, during that last cycle, um, the concept of regionality really came up, and we were talking about those numbers, and, and the, the subject was brought up, and if it's a regional concept, why can't we move some of those requirements from the jurisdiction that's being hamstrung to the one that actually has room? Because the jobs are one thing, the residents are another, and HCD shot us down on that, and I brought up the question about how do we reconcile the people who live in Riverside County and work in this county. Most of the firemen and policemen, nurses, uh, most of our city staff live in Riverside County because they can afford to. So the jobs are here, but if we build homes for people that don't live here because they can't afford it anyway, you know, they're not getting cheaper. I, I just think that the whole concept of using that as the qualifier is a little bit off. People live where they want to live or where they have to live and they work where they can afford to pay for where they live. So it's it's kind of a balancing act for the individuals. And I think the vice chair kind of pointed that out with the, the mobility of some of these people. So hopefully HCD and the state are looking at that as being a little less rigid, a little more flexible and letting the region decide what suits us best. And you're not looking very promising about that, Stacey, but. 
Thank you. We still have a little more research to do on what the jobs, like the jobs housing balance is going to turn out to. But based on the initial report, it sounds as though they're actually looking at something that would not be helpful and then looking at income levels of the commuters. But we don't have enough detail to know what that would amount to. All right. Uh, now we have some comments from our liaison with the Department of Defense, Muska. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing the Navy um, into this discussion. Housing affordability is a, a great issue, um, not only for our sailors, but also a large number of our um, civilian population who um, end up living further and further away from the bases and uh, having uh, longer commutes to get to work. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention one thing and clarify that it is Navy's policy not to um, house sailors on ship or abroad a ship um, while on shore duty. And it is a quality of life issue for the Navy. Um, as you can tell, mental um, health issues are um, increasing. These sailors are spending many, many hours, months, um, you know, out there at sea abroad these ships. So when they are on shore duty, we try to uh, provide, you know, a better quality of life for them. And that means housing outside uh, where they work. Um, so just wanted to, um, you know, clarify that. Um, and I do appreciate the um, city of Coronado's um, concerns. It is a complex issue. And I'm very glad to hear Antoinette say that we will have a chance to, um, you know, have input in the next uh, cycles methodology um, and find a solution um, that works for the city of Coronado and but as well for DOD. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you to my colleagues uh, for your comments. Certainly want to echo a lot of them and offer a few of my own and try to avoid getting up on a soapbox uh, and sharing my thoughts as I did uh, when um, uh, HCD came to the board before. Um, I'll start out by giving copies of letters that you've already seen, but I really want to emphasize some of the positions of the city of San Diego, which uh, I will echo. Um, uh, in addition to the comments that uh, Councilmember Donovan made uh, about the military component. It is not so much about the military as it is the impact of the opportunities for the military who does not like to spend money on housing. Uh, and yet somehow the individual city has that responsibility. Uh, but also to the group quarters in the city of San Diego, we've got some big universities. Um, uh, UC San Diego is going through a very aggressive uh, on campus that doesn't accrue any benefit at all uh, to the city of San Diego's numbers, even though that obviously uh, takes away a lot of the pressure uh, for um, and keeps those students away from homes uh, and that uh, can be taken up by city residents uh, and somehow coming uh, that. Um, I know we, our planning director participated in the sustainable communities. I know some of the ideas she floated were not necessarily widely accepted by some of the other members, uh, but I do wanna put a plug uh, for the idea that we've gotten, in my opinion and the opinion of others, we've gotten lost in the numbers. We keep talking about housing, but we're really talking about people. Uh, that's what we're really trying to do, put people into safe quality housing, hopefully as close to where they work uh, from a climate action point of view. Um, and we actually went through a period at the city of San Diego where we really try to incentivize studios and one bedrooms because that generated more units. Mm -hmm. I kind of realized that was kind of self-defeating uh, because we're not looking at the totality of, of the population of the city and who needs uh, housing that they can afford. Um, and so we've now shifted some of our zoning regulations to be a little more diverse in terms of the sizing. But we don't, we get actually almost penalized for that. And while some folks would want, would object to us switching entirely to only people, um, I think maybe given an option to cities to say, either hit these housing numbers or hit this many folks that you can uh, house uh, so that we really get a diversity in housing stock uh, going forward and hope to tackle some of the um, affordability uh, uh, concerns that we all have. Uh, the city is also supportive of the regional or sub-regional approach to sharing uh, housing responsibilities as long as that is paired with the infrastructure, whether it is um, uh, transit, whether it's parks, libraries at all. I don't know how you work out that formula, uh, but I think that's the that's kind of the compromise going forward. 
Um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what to say about legislators in Sacramento that I dearly love. Um, I, I think I communicated this in the briefing. I think we're at a pivot point where legislators are so desperate to look pro housing. They're looking at smaller and smaller tweaks uh, that probably won't produce another house uh, and are more likely to have unintended consequences. And we are failing to look at the really fundamental issue. And as I've begun to say, stop talking about density. Density is no longer the conversation. The conversation is how do we build housing affordable to low income and very low income and apparently even extreme, what is it, the uh, um, extremely low or acutely, acutely. low income uh, for homeless. So we're all incredibly important. We can't build that unless there is 100% subsidies for those units. And if we're not talking about that, then we're just playing in numbers games in which cities are being punished, especially with the builder's remedy, when something we can't, we can't do anything about. And, and um, I know my colleagues uh, have spoken about the frustration. You mentioned some uh, about, we great, we upzoned a property to make it eligible. I'm, you know, a for-profit builder built, built it and built market rate housing. And then the city gets, uh, gets in trouble for that is, I think the city made an important pivot. I think the message we have to send is we made, the state made an important pivot when it became apparent we weren't building the housing and we weren't building affordable housing and we weren't building truly affordable housing and got very, very aggressive because there are a lot of cities up and down the state that have been bad actors. But okay, let's take a moment and say, okay, now do we, how do we actually accomplish what we're trying to do? What is our actually our goal besides a, besides a numbers game? And how do we really begin to finance? And I don't have an answer for that either, uh, because the cost when you spend six, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars for a um, income restricted property, um, and it's essentially one hundred percent subsidized. Um, I think we're learning the painful lesson that uh, publicly owned land is not the panacea that we had hoped, uh, because the free land comes with other obligations and kind of neutralizes uh, that. So um, I know you're hearing a lot of stuff that you hear from a lot of other sources. Um, I appreciate the good work. I appreciate the executive committee trying to be as aggressive as they can. Um, the other thing, and, and maybe this is a question because I have to admit, I get these ideas and they go, I don't really know. H we get these directions from HCD. We've made a determination and whatever it is. Is that appealable to anybody? Uh, when the determination first comes from HCD, there's a consultation process with the MPO or the COG, and we can submit an appeal. For the last cycle, there was discussion of submitting an appeal, and the board ultimately decided not to. Um, so that is available under the current law. Okay. And then even individual interpretations of what state legislation, how that's applied, and how that should be interpreted? I think the seventh cycle will be a little different. Um, as you recall, the state auditor looked at HCD's process for coming up with a determination and, and found that um, there wasn't a lot of transparency in the process and the data wasn't peer reviewed or quality checked. Um, I think we'll learn a lot more in the seventh cycle because we'll be able to see what's happening behind the scenes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think all the cities have been frustrated. Um, I hope the city's not the only one where a developer comes in going, I got a letter from HCD and it's like, you're kind of stuck. Um, you may not like it. That's a different problem, but uh, the fact that there there may be different interpretations. Um, as a courtesy to my colleagues and the staff, I think I'll probably stop there and I'll circle back uh, uh, with uh, my city representatives on the executive committee to offer additional thoughts. Uh, but again, I do appreciate Sandag willing to take this kind of leadership uh, and talk with HCD, but I think it's just so important to for them to kind of figure out what are we really doing and, and are really, really achieving the goals. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll close with something that I probably shouldn't say out loud, but I think the control that develop, the developers have and even the affordable developers have uh, up in Sacramento, which try to create as much economic opportunity. I want home builders to be successful. I want nonprofits to be successful, but we have to really figure out how we're gonna achieve the goal that we actually have, which is housing people, whether it's middle income folks, people that work in our cities at low income levels, how can they live close to where they work? Uh, how do we tackle the folks that are living on the street and need to get into permanent supportive housing? 
we're not we're not we're not doing that and i know that's a tough conversation that's a bit of an ugly conversation that nobody really wants to get into but anyway i'll stop there so uh again thank you for all the good work stacy you've done and everybody has done on sandag and, and willing to take this on yes yeah absolutely so just as a as a piece of information i appreciated what our navy representative had to say when i talk about you know 20,000 plus or minus employees coming in for the navy those aren't all active duty navy people i don't know the exact number but i would say between 30 and 50% are active duty and the rest are civilian employees employed by the navy so i just wanted to clarify that we we definitely want to take care of our sailors and i think we do we need to keep coordination with the navy because i know the navy's interested in building housing and supporting air people as well so um, thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Councilman. There's a lot of delicate, nuanced conversations in this. We want to make sure that we're trying to clearly communicate the points we're trying to make. And so I appreciate that clarification. So with that, uh, we'll move on to our final item for today, item six, which is the 2025 Regional Plan Draft Sustainable Community Strategy Land Use. And I will turn it over to Carrie Simmons to present this item. And to worry. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Tuere Faola. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director for Sustainable Communities in our Regional Planning Department, and I'm joined here by Carrie Simmons, who's an Associate Regional Planner. And we are happy to be here to talk to you about the draft Sustainable Community Strategy Land Use. It is a mouthful, so we will likely say throughout the presentation, draft SCS land use pattern um, as we continue. But before I turn it over to Carrie, I just want to briefly talk about what is uh, a sustainable communities, you know, land use pattern and the purpose and not going into all the details here on the screen, but the draft, a draft sustainable community strategy uh, land use pattern is something that we need to do as part of our SB 375 requirements. And it's also something that can be used as one of many different things that we have within our regional plan to help us in achieving our federal and our state um, targets related to air quality and reducing GHG. You can see here on the screen a couple of other things that uh, are part of the benefit of having a sustainable community strategy land use pattern, whether it is anything from funding opportunities or CEQA streamlining. But the one that I really want to point out here is the, the last bullet, is that I want to make sure that it, it and really kind of explaining what it does not do, and it does not supersede any of your local land use plans or your policies that you have in place. So again, this is a land use pattern that we use as part of our uh, proposed regional plan, but it does not supersede any of your local land use planning uh, efforts or your policy. So with that, I'm going to ask Carrie to walk through all of the collaboration and the work that she's been doing with our city, uh, city and county staff and really getting us to this point. So Carrie. Thanks, Tori. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'd like to start off my presentation today by explaining these, these four key terms that you'll hear throughout the presentation. Each of these plays an important role in regional land use planning, but they also represent distinct efforts with unique requirements, data sets, and purposes. I'm starting on, I'll start with our sustainable community strategy land use pattern. And as Tori mentioned, um, the regional plan is not just about transportation projects, policies, and programs, but there's also a land use component to it that supports all of this effort. And as a kind of a preview for this regional plan, we're proposing a land use pattern that's consistent with all of your jurisdiction's general plans while still ensuring that we meet our state requirements. And this presentation that I'll cover today is gonna go over those requirements. I'll speak to the approach we took when developing the land use pattern, speak to outreach and feedback, and then I'll touch on key points to know about our proposed land use pattern. Um, next is our series 15 growth forecast, which you might've heard about before. And, and this forecast estimates future jobs, housing and population out till 2050 and informs the regional plan development. Um, you can kind of think of these jobs, population and housing as inputs into our land use pattern and identify where growth could potentially occur. The forecast was presented to RPC on March 1st and is linked in the report for this item today. Next is our transportation investment areas or TIAs. And these were previously known as mobility hubs in our 2021 regional plan. And these are areas with a high concentration of people, destination and travel options. And they're prime locations for growth that were identified in the 2021 plan. TIAs can span from one to several miles and they're key to our overall land use strategy. And finally, RENA, which you just heard a lot about, is a plan for an eight-year cycle of housing growth. It considers both future regional need as well as past underproduction. 
jurisdictions will update a housing element every eight years to identify locations for this growth. And our SCS must accommodate these RENA units as required by state law, which I'll speak to on this slide here. So as Tori mentioned, as part of development of the regional plan, SB 375 requires SANDAG to create a land use pattern that when mixed with our transportation network and project and policies will help us reduce or achieve our regional reduction, uh, GHG reduction target. And additionally, when we develop the plan, we're required to use all of your most recent local planning assumptions uh, from each jurisdiction. We gather all this information through extensive collaboration with your staff uh, during the series 15 development that occurred last summer and fall. The SCS land use pattern, as I mentioned, must also accommodate RENA. We confirm this by utilizing your jurisdiction's general plan and housing elements, which ensures there's sufficient location for these potential development of RENA units. And I wanna note that the proposed plan does not assume that all these units will actually get built. It just needs to identify locations where it could be. And it's also important to note that Tuari mentioned as part of SB 375, the land use pattern does not supersede local land use policy. However, projects that are in alignment with our SCS could be better poised for funding opportunities and also could see some CEQA streamlining benefits. And finally, uh, the SCS is submitted to the California Air Resources Board or CARB for final approval to ensure compliance with state law. So development of this land use pattern really began about over a year ago uh, through meetings with our series 15 task force. And this is a task force made up of local land use and housing planning staff from all of our 19 jurisdictions. This group was initially convened to provide input on our series 15 forecast and ensure we were using the most up-to-date data from all your staff. Recognizing this group's expertise, we reconvened the task force in February this year to focus on the SCS land use. This was followed by eight one-on-one -on -one meetings that we held with cities in early March, where we discussed your staff's preferences for what they'd wanna see in a land use pattern. We shared our approach, we discussed any relevant legislation to consider, and we addressed any comments and questions. Taking all of this feedback from staff, we developed the proposed land use pattern, as well as two additional land use scenarios, which was presented to our Sustainable Communities Working Group in April for discussion. I'll touch on these additional scenarios and our overall approach in a later slide. After taking this input to the Sustainable Communities Working Group, the proposed land use pattern was presented in early August at a joint working group meeting between the Sustainable Communities and Mobility Working Group. Now we're bringing this to RPC and it's planned to go to the board later this month. In the remainder of the presentation, I'll touch on the feedback that we heard from your staff and I'll also discuss the proposed land use pattern. So during outreach, right off the bat, your staff expressed very strong interest in being involved in development of the SCS land use and really wanting to provide input on where they, what they would like to see in our land use pattern. Some key feedback that we heard included a desire for alignment between local and regional planning assumptions and really ensuring that forecasted growth is in alignment with future transportation investments across the region. When discussing the proposed land use pattern, there was a general consensus among staff that supported our approach. However, with regards to some of the additional land use scenarios that I'll touch on later, there were some concerns about balancing some state goals related to GHG, housing, and VMT. Lastly, staff emphasized to us the importance of SANDAG's role to support them in messaging and education on what the SCS land use is and what forecasted, forecasted growth means for the region. So this slide outlines the high level approach uh, that we took to develop the SCS land use pattern and really what we discussed with your staff through our various points of outreach. We began by proposing uh, this land use pattern on the screen and it's made up of each of your jurisdictions general plans that's represented in this pink box here. Um, this pattern is consistent with all your current local land use planning assumptions and can be really considered business as usual. However, in addition to this proposed pattern, um, staff developed two alternative land use scenarios, which are here in purple and blue. And these were just potential options if our preliminary GHG modeling results showed us that we weren't gonna be meeting our reduction target. And these scenarios really differ from the proposed one that's up there in pink because they go beyond your general plans and really look to shift some of the forecasted growth, um, increase some densities and mix some land uses to potentially reduce VMT and GHG emissions even further than the proposed land use scenario. The arrow represents more focused growth as you move down from our proposed scenario to scenario three. 
We shared and discussed all of these scenarios and this approach with your staff, just in case we would may need to use the second or third, but based on some preliminary modeling results, we look to be on track with meeting our current target and we may not need to present scenarios two and three and can move forward with modeling proposed scenario one. So in summary, this slide represents our proposed land use scenario for the draft regional plan. As I mentioned, just to reiterate, the pattern is consistent with your general plans and your housing elements. It aligns very closely with our Series 15 forecast, and it meets the state requirements we need to meet for SB 375. This map on the screen shows our proposed transportation investment areas, or TIAs. And as a reminder, these are areas in the region with a high concentration of people, destination, and travel options. And this slide really emphasizes why we were able to propose the land use scenario we're proposing and why we didn't need to pursue the additional scenarios. Because our model indicates that 79% of forecasted growth would occur in a TIA using the proposed land use pattern. And since this proposed land use pattern is consistent with your adopted general plans, it indicates that your cities are already planning for growth in Sandex TIAs. And this really highlights a strong alignment between regional and local planning. This supports our view that the proposed land use pattern is a good approach to share with the board and move forward in the draft regional plan. In fact, the proposed pattern would result in all jurisdictions receiving housing, future housing growth, with most seeing a four to 15% increase in units by 2035, and three jurisdictions expected to exceed a 15% increase. These projections are very similar to our series 15 forecast projections. The image uh, here depicts what happens next with our SCS land use pattern. The land use pattern alongside the transportation projects and policies and programs are all seen as inputs into SANDAG's regional transportation model, which we call the ABM. ABM stands for our activities-based model and it's an essential modeling tool to quantify emissions and demonstrate that we're meeting state and federal requirements. The results of this model will tell us if we're meeting our 19% reduction target Recent modeling results indicate that our current draft regional plan, including the proposed SCS, looks to be in range of potentially meeting the target. And so I'm now gonna pass it off to Tawari to wrap things up and go over some more next steps. Thank you, Carrie. So just to quickly tell you where we're going after, um, after this presentation. So as Carrie said, the initial concept as well as the policies and programs that were presented to the Board of Directors earlier this year also includes our land use pattern that she just presented to you today. So that's our SES land use pattern one. And so that is currently continuing in its modeling stages right now to ensure that, as she said, we look like we're close in range, but we need to continue our modeling for that uh, SES land use pattern along with the initial concept and the policies and programs. But we also model not just only looking at how we can reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions and meet those state targets as well as air quality targets for the federal government. We also model to understand how does our transportation network along with this land use pattern and our policies, how does it do in terms of uh, achieving our regional goals for our plan around how our system is convenient, how it's equitable, healthy, as well as safe. Once we get through some of that modeling of those performance measures to understand how the system performs overall, we present a preferred concept that gives us also the detailed cost estimates for each of the projects that are in the plan, as well as with our overall funding strategy. When that's complete, we'll be bringing forward our draft regional plan in spring of 2025, followed by our draft environmental impact report in the summer and then bringing back to the board of directors after we've completed the public comment period and addressed all of those comments, a final regional plan and a final environmental impact report in late 2025. We'll bring that to the board of directors for approval and adoption. So that concludes our presentation and we'll turn it back over to the chair and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. All right, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the good work in bringing this forward. Uh, Tessa, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, Chair. I have one public commenter. Truth, please come to the podium. All right, you got a game. Fill in the blank. Climate change is, depending on your belief, it's a cult mantra excuse for GHG reduction for the climate cult. It's the only way to get the state and federal funding is you can't question the religion. This item says there are forecast assumptions. How can assumptions be sustainable? 
especially if the state and Santa Ana's past forecasts have been incorrect. Even the information presented at the board retreat was questioned by at least a few reps there. There's no strategy and assumptions. If the only areas which are labeled transportation investment areas are areas with a high concentration of people, destinations, and travel choices, then doesn't that mean that all the other areas are disinvested and discriminated against by SANDAG? I demand recent transportation disinvestments are also considered for equity. Who even decides what the destinations are? Are they restaurants, theme parks, nature preserves? And where are these high quality transit services that are referred to in this item? We got 52-year-old men getting stabbed and 15-year-old children getting shot to death at trolley stops. We've also got trolleys that break down all the time. There's new electric, not-so-rapid buses that can't even ride efficiently on the highways. That's what I learned at MTS. There's the 227 ghost buses that the residents of Imperial Beach are actually boycotting. Half of those buses that ride along Seacoast are not in service. Tell me where high quality's at. Because one way to understand how the system's working is not your modeling. It's actually using it and seeing for yourself. Doesn't Sandag claim to create a network of connected communities, not to create victims who have to rely on unsafe and inefficient public transit? Because especially if you were to live in East County or want to go there, it's actually the most disconnected and disinvested area within the county by both Sandag and MTS. Even in beach communities, like IB, nobody's using the bike lanes. Nobody. As you talked about inputs and outputs, and that is called technocracy, because there's no computer modeling that can replicate common sense. And if anyone needs the BOD dates for slide five, they were missing. It's September 13th and September 27th. Thank you for the two minutes, Joe. And that concludes the public comments on item six. All right. Uh, thank you again to that. Uh, for the presentation and the good work brought forward. We'll turn it over to committee members for comments and questions. Council Member Ma uh, Musgrove. I'll go with the white elephant. The three uh, jurisdictions that would see an increase in excess of the 15 or the 4 to 15, you knew that was coming. Yep. Uh, the city of Chula Vista, the city of Oceanside, and the city of San Marcos. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, so I have a couple. One, um, am I mistaken or is this kudos to the various cities for actually nailing it with their general plans? We get beat up so much. <laughs> I think there is a moment here to actually recognize that good work and how they've done their general plans. Absolutely. Um, it, it is a lot of kudos to our jurisdictions because of the good work that they have done. 79%, as Carrie showed on the screen there, are already projected to be shown through the work that you've done through your housing elements, your journal plan, and land use updates that we, it's not a lot to shift or change thereafter. So that's why we're able to move forward with our SES land use pattern one. All right. Uh, thank you for confirming that. And then just to also double confirm, you, if I understood correctly in terms of the timeline, there's still going to be additional modeling. Do you think there might be some changes that might come out of that next iterations of modeling? Yeah, we're, we're still very much modeling. I mean, when we, that's why Carrie used kind of cautious words and that, you know, preliminary and, and all of the different acronyms she could put towards it. Sure. Um, but we, we still feel very confident that we would move forward with the land use scenario one. Again, that kudos to our jurisdictions, 79%, that doesn't leave us very much in terms of being able to shift. And so we feel confident that this is the land use pattern that makes the most sense for us to move forward. Um, and so certainly we will be coming back to the board and giving an update as modeling continues, but the land use pattern for the presentation today, we intend to stay as a land use pattern moving forward. Just wanna add one comment to that. And that is that the state Air Resources Board has to review and provide comments on our modeling technical methodology still. So based on feedback that we get from them, we submitted our methodology in April. We're still waiting their feedback, but that could result in changes to the model um, and the modeling assumptions, and then we'd have different numbers. So we can't really report out exact numbers yet on GHG reduction until ARB gives us the sign off. Okay. I'll take the celebration and kudos today. <laughs> And, and to close the loop, that also means as a regional planning committee, we don't have to make any very difficult decisions because we can lock in number one. So um, I'd love to do that, but I'm happy not to do that. So uh, so again, thank you very much for the good work you did. Um, and we'll look forward to future updates as you evolve through that process and outside reviews uh, that may change those. So we'll take that under advisement that could change. So, but thank you for that. 
Um, with that, not seeing any other comments by the committee, uh, that brings us to the end of our agenda. I appreciate everyone's participation today. The next regular meeting of the Regional Planning Committee is Friday, November 1st, 2024 at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.